Okay, we're uh, going to explore <clears throat> Plato's Republic, the study of arithmetic. I ruled out the word arithmetic and I replaced it with the word number. Perhaps we'll see why. The study of number in the Republic is the primary study that's to convert the soul and turn it towards true being. Therefore, it's a spiritual discipline. So, it's a turning about. By the study of this, so it is claimed, one can then turn the soul around from becoming to being or usia. Sometimes we call that usia essence. So what? What's so significant about this curious process? Well, I want to make sure we can take off tonight being clear on why it is considered so important to be able to participate in this realm called being. Now, it's going to take on certain qualities, and you're familiar with a good number of them. All right, good old divine luminosity. All right. A brilliant radiance. And when this is encountered, one recognizes at, as preeminently real, therefore we call it being. There's a vitality and total fullness of life or liveliness to it, so we call that vitality to it and it partakes of the very nature of mind as insight or intellect. Now, again, this is, all right, this is an experience and this is what is encountered and therefore when the soul encounters this or when man encounters that, we have to know why it's considered so significant. So, I'm just going to read a paragraph at 490A, which is <clears throat> book six. Then will it not be our reasonable defense that the real lover of knowledge, by his nature, <clears throat> strives towards real being? Now that's what is called real being and is not content to abide by, the, by this multitude of things which exist only in opinion. Forwards he always goes, He's never blunted, never ceases from that love, until he grasps the nature of what really is. By that part of the soul to which it belongs to grasp such a thing, and that is the part akin to real being. Then, going in unto this, mingling with the real, he begets mind and truth. He would know, truly live, and be nourished, and so he would cease from his travail, but never before. So, by mingling with the real, he begets mind and truth, or intellect, right? That's, that's, what you, that's what comes out of it. Look here. That's what comes out of it. That's what you give birth to. Right? A way of seeing intellect and truth. Now,
When we're now studying number in Plato's Republic, that is among the studies, uh, basic studies leading to the education of the philosopher king. That's what it's all about. The first is arithmetic, as it's sometimes called, geometry. They talk about solid geometry, but it's not studied. Right. So we won't put it down. Astronomy, right. harmony, the dialectic. It presupposes this whole course of studies presupposes that someone has already mastered music and gymnastics in the way in which he understands those two terms. So this is the primary study, the opening study. And I'd like to go into it and explore it with you. Now, if I'm successful, you should be puzzled when it's over. That's only if I'm successful. If you understand it, then I've lost. All right. All I'm going to do is deal with a small section of Plato's Republic and try to bring out what's there, and that's what we're going to be doing. In this, <clears throat> this study of a number, we're going to call it number from now on, in this study of number, he gets to a key point and he says, the whole discussion that we've been after is to make it, to, to designate the difference between the intelligible and the visible. That's, that's, that's the whole thing. That's the purpose. So that's why I wrote over here, the intelligible and the visible. Now, there's another word for this, which we picked up from that last quote. It's also called the realm of opinion. And this is called the realm of uh, the intelligible. In any case, this is the divided line. In other words, there's an intimate connection between the sixth book of Plato's Republic called, in that great sixth book, there's a section called the divided line. And as you know, the divided line is made in such a way that it's constructed out of a golden section. This is the realm of images, image thinking, the image thinking. The kinds of images that you have must come from something. They come from beliefs. Now, that's the visible world. That's where that's our everyday world. That's the world of becoming. This is the world of becoming. This is the world of becoming. The next step is understanding. And the top, of course, is knowing. Now, in the sixth book, it's important to know that there's one particularly very interesting addition to this model, which I'd like to put in. All right. It says that, as everybody knows, the visible world there is a sun, light, and that makes things visible. And as a result, we can then perceive things as a result of that. And therefore, there's a source of the light called the sun. Therefore, the same dynamics are said to be above it. Therefore, the good That luminosity stands to light in the fifth, in our visible universe, and things seen, therefore, are knowable objects. All right, we'll call them the knowables. And as the eye sees here, so too in this world. So the soul sees. Therefore, it's a parallel, parallel. Now, we're going to use this language as we proceed. 
since he spends a good deal of time developing the structure of the study of number, if he concludes with this, that exactly picks up the major distinction, the divided line in book six. So we're going to see how that plays back and forth. Well, the first thing he does is that he, we, we said we must study something that applies to all of the studies that we're going to pursue. That's geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, harmony, and dialectic. So we need a study that applies to all. All right, that's what we need. A study that applies to all. All the arts and forms of understanding and knowledge. Right? That's what we must need. We have to study something that is common to all the arts and sciences. When he, Plato uses, when the translators translate the word science, it's really knowledge. So therefore, he said, what you have to do is study something that applies to all the arts and forms of understanding and knowledge. Now these two words, understanding and knowledge, as you can see in the divided line, we're calling that the divided line. Therefore, we're going to study something, you see, that applies to this whole realm. That's what he's saying. This whole realm. It applies to this whole realm, and that is number. And understanding is the dionoia, knowledge is episteme. And therefore, it applies to all of the arts. No, there are no arts below this line, of course. Arts in that knowledgeable sense, not popular arts, or visual arts, intellectual arts. Therefore, as there's, there's, we, what we must do is study number and the reasoning that goes with number. Let's say we must study number and the reasoning that goes with number. Now, now, this kind of reasoning that goes with number is variously translated, and some translators call it calculation. But that's, see, that already, that already assumes we know what he's talking about when we're talking about number because the word itself is logismo, which, which has that meaning, but it also means the kind of reason that goes along with number. Okay, we got it now. A certain kind of reasoning that goes along with number that applies to this whole realm. Mmm. Swell. It's actually, said, I'm doing something rather simple. All it requires is uh, learning how to make distinctions such as between one, two, and three. Ah, this whole thing is just making, yes. He said, because if you understand what I'm doing, that will awaken the intellect and it draws the mind to usia or essence. That's the province. What does it do? That what he's going to do with number, what he's going to do with number is going to awaken the mind, right? You're going to wake up the mind. Right? Right? We're going to wake up the mind. Boom! Right? It's going to draw the mind to this very experience. That's what it's going to do. Well, we're buying numbers, one, two, and three. This is preposterous. <laughs> it's absurd. <laughs> what he gets away with. Or there's something here. I mean, this is either trivial, and he's building a case out of literally trivialities and making it appear profound, or there's something worth looking at. Well, we'll take a look. He's all right. Is there three things? One, two, and three. I have to make a distinction between one, two, and three. By the way, he makes three kinds of judgments. He talks about three fingers. So we have a rep repetition of this very interesting idea. Let's take a look at what he's doing. Notice now, we're going to be talking about number, 
And the examples that he's going to use to show it have nothing to do with number whatsoever, which is exactly what you would expect. Let's see. He said, look here, the first kind of thing that uh, uh, in studying is that we use, the, we use perception. Some translators call this sensation. The word uh, sensation isn't as strong because it's perception. All right? Is there's a class of perception, and it doesn't awaken thought, it doesn't awaken the intellect, because the judgment by perception is adequate for a whole class of things. Perfectly, perfectly legitimate. There's a whole class of things that when you perceive, it doesn't awaken the mind of anything. Ah, ah, oh there, a piece of chalk. Perception, no, nothing comes up, it's no problem. You can see it, call it that perception. He says, now, but there's another kind of perception that yields nothing that can be trusted. It's these kinds of perceptions that invite the intellect to reflection. Now, he's look here. In order to make this clear, he's going to use three fingers. So you take the three fingers, and here you see three beautiful, a picture of three beautiful fingers, as you can tell. And he says, look, you know what? Each is a finger. Regardless of where it is, each is a finger. And in that respect, they don't differ. Ah, you can say one is bigger or smaller. You can say one is thinner or thicker. But this idea of bigger, all right, bigger, all of the ERs, that's a comparative judgment, right? That's comparative. I mean, this is certainly smaller than this, but it's bigger than this. And so on with all comparative judgments. All comparative judgments are relative to the thing that you're measuring it against. He said, therefore, perception then can report this as being both bigger and smaller. Oh, hey, look here, he says, you know what? The same thing is true for bigness. Now, notice we're moving from ERs to NESs. Hey, look here. Then, after all, what's bigness if it's dependent upon relative judgments? I mean, what's bigness? Is that independent of bigger? Yeah, you're pulling somehow a quality out of what you perceive as this is bigger than that, you're trying to grasp something beyond the comparative judgment when you talk about bigness, the quality of bigger. But then when you talk about bigness, uh, exactly what do you mean? Does it mean anything just by itself, bigness? Well, yeah, it's that quality which runs through all the judgments I make when I'm talking about something bigger than something else, but of course it brings in the other one depending upon what I judge it against. Well then, you see, what we mean by bigness, I'm inviting you, see, I'm inviting you right, to, to reflect on what we're talking about because I want to know whether the thing I'm talking about is one or two. Look, when I say two pieces of truck, one's bigger than the other. Uh, bigger, is that one thing? Bigness, uh, that's one thing. No, bigness is related to smallness. Uh, looks like I need to reflect on this a little more. Second kind of judgments, so you have to reflect a little more. This is easy, the first class of judgments, very easy. Solution. Well, the solution is, you know what you have to do? You have to invite the intellect, you have to invite your mind to contemplate the great and the small as distinct entities. Take it out of the class of comparatives. You have to pull it away. You have to say, what is bigness after all? Consider them as distinct entities. Now what have you got to forget that relative business for a moment? Now, once you do that, you raise yourself to this question. Right now, you can ask, 
what in the world is the great and the small? Because now we're pulling it away from particular judgments. We want to know, is there anything in the nature of reality that's great and small? Or is it just a made-up concept? Well, wait a minute. Have you ever seen a, a great mountain? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there some idea of greatness in that? Is that something you can grasp as you perceive it? People now. All people the same, or have, you, or have you encountered greatness? Then what is that greatness, whether it's in a mountain or in a person? What is it? Huh. Well, wow, look here. Look here. That's the origin of this distinction between these two realms. That's what he says. Remember what we said earlier? That's the, this kind of thinking pulls you out of this realm, the visible, the world of becoming, and gets you thinking about subjects which are very strange and invites the understanding to ask this question, what in the world is the great or the small? Look here, is there anything magnificent? Is there, is there anything that has some uh, vastness to it? I mean, is it there? What is it? What is it when it's there? Is it just a conclusion from sensation that we draw? Yeah, but is it there? Well, now I'm pulling out of the world of becoming, and I'm now dealing with whether or not there are a class of things you can talk about independent of sense experience. Right? Ah. Huh. That's what we're doing. Now look here. Third class. Remember one, two, three? Then he turns around and he says, all right, now that, now that you see this, what? Now that you see there's these two kinds of thinking, in what class does number and one belong? That's the question. Okay, that's the working question. Well, we know one thing. If either is adequately apprehended by perception, as with finger, you won't need to invite the intellect to inquire. I mean, anything you can understand fully, grasp fully, apprehend fully, by perception, you don't have to invite thought. But look here. In order to know what class, number, and one belong, shouldn't you know what one is? What is the one? Also talks that way. Look at what we just did. What is one what? One chair? One person? One marker? What happens then when you stick this curious little word in there? It makes it into a substantive as if it exists in its own right. Well, that's right. That's what it does. Now, why does he talk about the one? Oh, well, I forgot to tell you something, but you already know, but I want to remind you now. The idea of the good, remember? The idea of the good is equally expressed as the one. Look here. The highest concept, the good, is also described as the one. The one, the good. Now, what's the relationship between this highest term called the one and number one? Oh, look here. I know what to do. We'll just figure out what one is, and then we can decide what, see, in, in what class it belongs, and then we can worry about its metaphysical significance. So wait a minute, or do we have to first know what it is before we can put it into a class? Well, let's 
Hooker. He shifts now, and this is what he says about this study. We have to inquire into what is the one as such. That is, some other translations call it, what after all is the nature of the one. Other translations vary it, but this is a pretty good one. What is the one as such? And this is why he considers it very important. He says, this is one of the studies that guide and convert the soul to the contemplation of being. That's what it does. Well then, what does that mean? Well, let's see if we inherit a problem here. If there are two things, if there are two things and uh, each is distinct one from the other, then Together, there are two. Together, there are two. Let's get two things quite distant from one another just to play for a moment. Let's call one a contemplating philosopher, all right? Now, here he is contemplating, all right? And over here, let's get someone on the other extreme and say, here we have a... uh, Warrior. All right, a warrior, soldier, warrior, contemplating philosopher. Now, we have two, there are two of them. And uh, each is one. And together there are two. But if the, would you not agree? Any time, however, if you get two things, if they're inseparable, then they're one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought I'd turn the page for a moment. Got it. Can you, is that foolish? I mean, everybody studies arithmetic and knows numbers. There isn't anybody who's been to, to school for more than a couple of days or even before they go to school that they know what one is. Would you not agree with that? Yeah, that has to be And therefore, there's no reason to study something that everybody already knows. It does seem really odd. Yeah, good, good, <laughs> good. So look here then these two appear to be two. And each appears to be distinct from the other. Each appears to be one, both two. Each appears separate. But if each is one, then together they're two. But if there is, there's something about that it's inseparable, then it's one and not two. Wait a minute. Is it possible that there's something about these two? Is it possible that there can be something about these two quite distinct professions? That's one? If so, then you must look for the oneness, certainly not in the way they're functioning or their descriptions. But this is the heart of Plato's Republic because his philosopher king is called a guardian, a soldier. He says, hey, you know what? Our guardian is soldier and philosopher in one. Now look here, where do you find the oneness in that? Where do you find the oneness in that? 
Uh, Ms. Help out, please. What? Oh, the Amersand. Right in there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 But look here. You can't see it. You have to come to it by some process if you say that the, the philosopher, see the way he expresses it, uh, the guardian is, well, I can even give you a very fine quote for it. Um, the way he expresses it is, is just a delight. Um, For a soldier must learn them, numbers, in order to marshal his troops, and a philosopher because he must rise out of the region of generation and lay hold of, on essence, or he can never become a true reckoner. That's so. And then he comes back. And our guardian is soldier and philosopher in one. In the lobe, it's 163, it's 525B. Now look what he's saying now about it. It is fitting then, Glaucon, that this branch of learning should be prescribed by our law and that we should induce those who are to share the highest functions of the state to enter upon that study of calculation, that's that way of reasoning with numbers, and take hold of it, not as amateurs, but to follow it up until they attain to the contemplation of the nature of number by pure thought. Not for the purpose of buying or selling as if they're preparing to be merchants or hucksters, but for the uses of war and for facilitating the conversion of the soul itself from the world of generation to essence and truth. Now, what kind of numbers are you talking about? That's what I was going to ask. Well, I, I, asked it I asked it first. All right. No, reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> like, what kind of number? What are you talking about? Well, he says, in what respect? Why in the respect of the very point to which we're speaking? That it strongly directs the soul upward, compels it to discourse about pure numbers, never acquiescing if anyone prefers to it in the discussion of numbers attached to visible and tangible things. So we will not talk about number in respect to any tangible or visible thing. First rule, second rule. For you are doubtless aware that experts in this study, if anyone attempts to cut up the one in, in argument, laughs at him and refuses to allow it. But if you uh, mince it up, they multiply, always on guard lest the, the one should appear to be not one but a multiplicity of parts. We're not going to talk about the one therefore in terms of any multiplicity of parts. It has to remain pure and whole. Second rule. Most true. So suppose now, Glaucon, someone were to ask them, my good friends, what numbers are these that you're talking about in which the one is such as you postulate, each unity equal to every other without the slightest difference and admitting of no division into parts? He said, what do you think they'll answer? He said, this I think that they're speaking of units which can only be conceived by thought and which it is not possible to deal with in any other way. 
this branch of study it really seems to be indispensable for us since it plainly compels the soul to employ pure thought with a view to truth itself. Now let me give you a sh slight shift now. Right? Let me talk about this for a moment. Um, let us say they are some good things. All right, there are some good things. I'll mention a couple, you can do the same. Health, I call that a good thing, is it not? All right. Uh, intelligence can be a good thing. Wealth. And you can add any number right after this. All right. uh, one of the ancient problems, I'm going to sneak it in here and I hope it doesn't upset anybody. All right? All right. Let's look at these words. Would you agree that, now I'm going to let you use any one of these words, I'm going to talk about them in general for a moment. That there is something about them that we're calling good, right? That's what we said. There's something about them we're going to call, we're going to call it good. Would you not agree, uh, each one of these seems to produce something that we recognize. It's a kind of wholeness. Because take wealth. If I take the wealth that I have and disperse it widely, randomly, well, it doesn't come together. It can't be bound together. It can't have any wholeness. Uh, health. There's some kind of wholeness, even if you're talking about good food, there's some kind of wholesomeness about it, wholeness about it. That's that nest problem, isn't it? Well, if the good is that which in some way brings about the wholeness of things, if that's what it does, it brings about the wholeness of things, and what makes whole, because after all, you have to make, there has to be a whole before you can have wholeness, right? Before you can have uh, bigger, you have to have bigness. Before you can have bigness, there has to be something big or great. So if you call it good, if you call these things good, they must have some kind of wholeness about it. That presupposes the existence of a whole. But what makes whole and, and uh, holds together, well, whatever is there, holds together whatever is there of each. Well, if it holds it together, it holds it together as one, doesn't it? It holds it together as one. And what do you agree if it holds it together at one? Um, by the good's presence, then each is perfected. There's a perfection going on, isn't it? There's a perfection going on. And so the, there's a perfection going on. And the perfection is going on is a consequence of that unity. Right? Unity presupposes one, which is why I put it there. Hey, wait a minute now. If we're talking seriously about this, then in talking this way, it should fit all of these. Well then, can we talk about wholeness without talking about whole? Can we talk about whole without something holding together? Some, right? Or whatever it is, the being of each? And if you can talk about what holds it together, then it has some kind of curious existence as one. Because as a consequence of its presence, it brings about the perfection of each of these things. 
And if it brings about the perfection of each of these things because of some curious thing called one, then that oneing process, that oneing process must be some uh, process inherent in whatever has a goodness to it. And it's because of that oneing process that the wholeness and the whole and the perfection of each is brought about into a unity. And oneing, of course, presupposes the one. Oh, it doesn't. It? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what the one is, just, you know, just by itself, what is the one? Since it seems to be an evidence in any of these in the way in which we just talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Let's change that good to bad. Okay. So oh, sure, we can do that. <clears throat> yeah. Identically? Oh, yeah, yeah. Except and we'll have if we call, yeah, perfection yeah. rather than perfection. If we call it bad, then um, will it still, no, I mean, will it still, no, that's okay. Call it bad for a moment. Intelligence definitely can be bad. Wealth can be bad. Humor can be bad. Health, most probably, I can't immediately think, but I'm sure. Oh, certainly. Things can be bad. That's true. You mean if something else is added to it? No, no, no. Just a lot of intelligent people are That's very true. unhappy. A lot of wealthy people. I think you're quite right. Produces a lot. Yeah, of that's what absolutely. Most people would say badness, etc. And yet, yeah. the wholeness of yeah. When something is bad, it still has the wholeness. Yeah, yeah. These are not complete in themselves. They require something else to be perfect. But what happens when right? they're imperfect? What stops them from still having the wholeness? What stops them from being wholeness? No. Insofar as there is health, there is a wholeness. Right. And right. if that health is bad, and it it's doesn't. Still got its wholeness. I, I don't want to lose what you're saying, so. Uh, it, let's look at what? intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Intelligence. Mm -hmm. Since intelligence produces mm -hmm. sadness, mm -hmm. let's call it bad. Most people would agree that sadness is not good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, watch. Is there a difference between these things? and what someone may do possessing these things. If the outcome of someone having that is bad, then I would say intelligence is bad. Yeah, but that wouldn't be the case, would it? It's, mm -hmm. Because intelligence isn't bad, it's what you should put it to. Health is in... Then it can't be good either. <clears throat> Pardon me? Then, then it's not good either. Yeah, okay. The, our point would be, we can call it good if there is, if there, from our judgment, there's a goodness about it. That is to say, if it has these qualities. It is not the good, you're absolutely right. Like, take health. Look here, watch. Again, you read my mind. <laughs> right? Yeah. <clears throat> he can be in perfect health, and he can be very intelligent and have the wealth of, of the ages about him. But it, does it depreciate the fact that he's healthy because he used it for the purposes that he did? He's still healthy. So healthy, being healthy, is a condition of all the parts functioning together on an ideal level, so all the parts come together and produce a wholeness. But depending upon what you use them, then this thing might become one. So the whole goal in this game is when you talk this way, now we only have one question, and that's the big one which you're on. Can the mind be a one? Can the mind be a one? That's the whole issue. If the mind can be a one, if there can be a unity of the mind, uh-oh, wholeness, whole, holds together, be a one. And therefore, what's quite interesting in Plato's Republic is that it ends precisely on that issue. And let me see if I can give it to you quite clearly. Um, Um. 
in all this, this is the education. And, 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 uh, the big conclusion in book 10, I'm on uh, 603D, book 10. In all this then, is a man of one mind with himself? Or is there a rebellion within him? Within him? Is he at war with himself in his doings? As where sight was concerned, there was internal strife, and he had contrary opinions within him about the same things at the same time. Oh, I remember now. We need not come to agreement about that again, for we have already agreed sufficiently about all this in our former discussion, that our soul is laden with thousands of such contradictions which exist all at once. So that's the nature of man. It's contradictions. We're full of all contradictions. What's the goal then? This then is a man of one mind with himself. Can you bring about a oneness to the mind? If you bring about a oneness to the mind, if I can just jump back into the idea of justice, notice how the idea of the one reappears. I'm on uh, four, four, three. D E book four. <clears throat> and he's talking about the three parts of the soul. And I'm just skipping in here. But he must have managed his own well, and himself have ruled himself, and set all in order, and become a friend to himself. He must have put all three parts in tune with him, highest, lowest, middle, exactly like the three chief notes of a scale, and any other interval between that there may be. He must have bound all these together and made himself completely one out of a many. Temperate, concordant, and only... <laughs> And then only do whatever he does, getting wealth, care of the body, even matters of state or private contract. In all these, he must believe and name as just and beautiful dealings, whatever practices preserves its condition and works along with it. And as wisdom, he must name the knowledge which presides over this practice. And what kind of a practice is it? Making a one out of a many. Well, look here. <laughs> if the goal is to make one mind, a one mind, and to get, deal with all the contradictions and turmoils in ourself, and the whole goal then is to make ourselves one out of many, what is this one? Which when it's present in these things we call wholeness, and anything, any distinction you make is always one. I mean, you can't see anything that isn't a one. Oh. Right? Any time you use the mind, you're making distinctions, right? Whole, one, whole, parts, unity, all the time. Therefore, look here, all we see are things, each a unity of parts, but, each is, but as each thing is one, it is no different from any other one. So wait a minute. So is it possible to grasp the nature of one? Because if so, then we'll see the oneness in each and everything, and there's no difference. But wait a minute, you mean there's no difference between this and the oneness of a man's mind who's been brought to a unity? The oneness of health, the oneness of intelligence? Well, I know how you decide that. All you have to do is know what the one is first. <laughs> and, uh, Miss, what is it? What is it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Pardon? Arithmetic. Yeah, but now look here, see? Look here. Let's take a look at arithmetic. 
strictly speaking, right? Agree? Or any, any other such thing? But this is one, two, is it not? And each, uh -huh. and each, two and each is a one, yeah. right? And there's not the slightest difference between any of the ones that make up a two, is there? No, 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 no. No difference at all. And they don't have any parts, do they? Right. Because whatever number you're talking about, there must be a one to it, otherwise it wouldn't be a number. Is that right? Uh uh. It's always over one. Right. Say, well, we don't recognize that, but we should. There is no number without a one under it. That is, what is that saying? I'm saying that's all there is. I'm not talking about anything else. I'm just talking about that. Everything else in the universe can subs just pass into insignificance. Look at Suppose I do this. One over? Yeah. One over two? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Suppose someone comes along and goes, wait a minute. Uh -huh. <laughs> so wait a minute. So when you're adding, are, are you not just dealing with ones? Yes. And the, your conclusion is only ones? Yep. So all you're doing is putting numbers on one. Yep. And, <laughs> and if there's not the slightest difference between any of the ones that you have, I wonder how many ones you have. Good, I hope so. This is what he's doing. See, this is what he's doing. So, yes, well, David? I was, I was thinking, I, I, I was thinking, like, the concept of health, the uh, contact, the concept of health mm -hmm. should also suggest uh, disease. And if if, if we would have put mm -hmm. disease, mm -hmm. uh, if we would have put disease under our, our list of, of things, and we could, and, and we, and uh, if the one, uh, and we would call it good as well, then, Let's try. then uh, in ignorance, and call them, call these, these things are in the same list, then, uh, when we talk of, uh, if there is one and this, there's no difference between disease and health or between ignorance and intelligence, then uh, if they are the same, then what is the nature, you know, yeah. the, the nature of the one? And I, I yeah. think, I said, well, when, uh, when a person, when we, the process of of wanting, just as we found the 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 single identity of the philosopher and mm -hmm. the warrior earlier, and that uh, by contemplating, uh, I guess by searching for their oneness, we were able to to make the the warrior and mm -hmm. the philosopher one. Mm -hmm. Then also, it would seem that contemplating the concept. Um, disease and health, and see that that those concepts are one or one as well. Of course, of course. You see, if you have the idea of disease and health, that is one. And what would that oneness be? All the ways in which man can represent his his physical condition. That's right. Ignorance and intelligence. Between those two extremes, you can represent all the degrees to which man can be said to exhibit uh, the one and uh, by uh, its, its deprivation the other. But there's certainly a difference between the oneness of each of these because while each is a one, each is a one, 
Would you not agree? Disease as different from wholeness presupposes the parts, the parts of uh, whatever it is that has disease, the parts of the body are not functioning either together or separately as a wholeness. But there is some malfunctioning. Therefore, this is a matter of degree disease, right? As it moves away from wholeness, whole, and all things together for, into a higher unity. So, yes, it is possible to talk about the how, difference between each it, of these being a one. How can it move away from whole? How can the one move away from wholeness? Well, how, see, um, the wholeness that it has it has only on condition that all of the parts function together ideally. That's its, see, that's a, this is an emergent condition. It is an emergent condition. It is not intrinsic to the thing. That's if it were intrinsic to the thing, it could never depart from it. Well, if you say that, then mm -hmm. it seems as though you're suggesting that wholeness and oneness is periodic. That at one time we yes. have wholeness, mm -hmm. and at one time, uh, one time we have oneness, and then one time we have the many. Yes. And it seems as though, That's in right. my own thinking, it seems as though that um, that that's not that that's not the case. It, it would seem that uh, either there is one or there is not one. Either there is one or there is the many. You're absolutely right. These things are in the visible world. And therefore, if they are going to be these things purely, it can't be among things that are physical and depend upon other factors coming together into a unity. Therefore, the question is now, looking at this word, being, that we used before, right, whether or not these words and this vocabulary fits that uniquely but only appears in the physical world episodically, periodically, and only manifests itself under certain conditions. That's right. We want to see whether or not we can gain an insight into the legitimacy of these terms when applied in the physical world and lifted up into the intelligible world where they stay constant and inseparable. That's right. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah. So what we're saying is that somehow in the world of becoming, this is the world of becoming and appearance, we see the presence of these higher qualities, but only as shadows. Their fullness is in the intelligible realm. And that's why he is saying, hey, get up there and take a look. Mingle, mingle in this world. Get into this world. Experience it as much as you can. Yeah. It would seem that health exists in the uh, health exists in the uh, in the visible world yeah. along with disease, mm -hmm. so that in the invisible world there is neither health nor disease because those are things that exist in the, in the physical world. You're absolutely right. That's absolutely right. There has to be the quality of health in the in that world raised to this word. That quality of healthiness, fullness, full being, uninterrupted excellence, that's right. Health in the body is a shadow of that. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Question? Sir? You were saying that um, all, all, everything is one. All things are ones, and the one is an infinite sequence of ones. Yeah, and the mind can only function grasping one. Oneness all the time. So it's like trying to drive down the freeway and to read a billboard, I mean to look at a billboard sign and not read it. So if the one is an infinite sequence of ones, the warrior and the philosopher are just two states of the infinite sequence mm -hmm. of ones. There's a lot more to it than just that, right? Because, yes, he's inviting, he's inviting you. If, so if, the, if the warrior can become, in fact, the philosopher, and the philosopher, in fact, becomes the warrior, if there isn't any difference between them, 
and they both achieved a state of mind which can be called one, then what kind of one is that in the mind which can be present in both, yet they appear, see the word appear all runs through the whole thing, so, the so different and distinct from one another. So the warrior and the philosopher is just another spin on the bug and the butterfly. The what? Another spin on the bug and the butterfly. I don't know if I understand that. Uh, you, the worm and the butterfly? Yeah, the worm and the Caterpillar butterfly. and the butterfly? Oh, okay. yeah. One is the other and the other is the one. Fork, uh, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, if the one is in the sequence of many ones, they're all one, why he chooses a particular warrior and a philosopher to, to play out this game? I mean, you could just as easily be, a, you know, a bug and a, uh, a butterfly, or well, I guess there's other contradictions, too. Well, um, oh, is he just trying to show? Uh, he's just trying to show a contradiction so that you, you pop into the contemplation. Is that it? Or? Well, first of all, I appreciate you trying to, you know, to keep talking because that saved me from your first question, which I enjoyed more than. You. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, 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 no. I'm joking. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Sometime when you have a good question going, just let the other let, the, <laughs> let them have it and don't save them with another. Um, the question you're raising, as I understand it, is there some inner need why Plato had to choose in describing uh, the Republic the role of the guardian? Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, his whole, his whole uh, purpose is that there are three parts of the soul, and what you need is that the intellect and the mind, if you want, all right, the spirit, spirited part, not spirit, spirit active, and the appetitive. <clears throat> right. the, physical, the physical? Yeah, ap appetites. Appetites, the appetitive, right, spirited part. <clears throat> this is the soul. This is the. All right. And his primary, his primary goal is to try to show that justice that justice in itself is its own reward. That's his primary goal. The whole republic is nothing other. Matter of fact, its, its title is Dikaiosuin. Righteousness is a better word than the word justice because the word justice in our society is intimately connected with law. <laughs> and it shouldn't be because that's not what he's doing. It's righteousness. As of the quote I just read previously was a state of justice. Now, if this is the condition He's saying, look here, these two have to come together. The spirited part has to accept the intellect or mind as its ruler. Right. So from this, he naturally gets the ruler, that you have to rule your own soul. To show that and to explore how you can become a ruler of your own soul, he said, that's so difficult. I'll make an analogy, and that is the soul is going to be said to be like the city-state. And therefore, I'm going to make design a city-state because it's easier to see in something large than see something small. And therefore, there must be a special class of people in the state that are going to be guardians, rulers, just like in the soul there must be a part within us that's going to be the ruler, and we'll call that ruler our guardian. And he calls that guardian in the state the soldier, the warrior, the warrior king. Okay, does that help answer the question? Or we can go back to it now. We can elaborate it more than I thought we would, but oh. that's probably good. But I thought that maybe the mind and the spirit would be like a philosopher. A spirited mind would be a philosopher, and a spirit after might be a warrior. That's not the way to think about that. No, I think this takes the exact same form, by the way, as the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna, the warrior, is the philosopher. He he's, uh, becomes the student of Krishna. And finally, he has to learn how to become the philosopher in action to achieve what the other achieves in contemplation. 
for in the Bhagavad Gita, there's no difference between action and contemplation. They're both using the mind in some direct way. Pardon me? A spirited appetite like rage or hate or... Yeah. Can actually, you know, that's... Well, on a mass scale, that's war. Yeah, and the whole question is, can you go into war without fear and without uh, anger and fury? Can you keep your cool in the middle of a battle? You'd probably be a better warrior, yeah. And that's... Is it necessary also in contemplation? to have a detachment to whatever comes up in your own mind. Okay. Right. See, the, uh, classic, the classic problem is the sannyasin, the one who goes off and, and uh, lives in the forest, contemplating, avoids the life of action. Right. But he can't escape action because between his ears, Meditating, he's going to have to deal with all kinds of content of his mind. That's going to urge him, even in the world of imagination, into action. He's still going to have to deal with action, either in here or out here. And he's going to have to keep one pointed here. He's going to have to keep one pointed here. Good heavens, one is back again. Um. I want to go back to arithmetic. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I know, the Greeks didn't have a symbol for zero. Or, yes. Whereas the Indians did. True. And he starts with a one, but lots of esoteric systems, mm -hmm. uh, let's say Kabbalah starts with a zero, which is even mm -hmm. um, higher than the one, or, or not higher, but predates or comes, it's more abstract than the one, or I don't know how to put it. In, yeah. Definitely in Kabbalah, yeah. zero. And then the yeah. Hindus have yeah. a zero. You yeah. have the concept of nirvana and all sorts of... Um, yeah. And the Kabbalah, or do they have a one, is, is that... Um, the, before you the, get the one to, or zero, huh? uh, is there such a thing as zero? Um, there's the iron self, etc. All the, the things which come before you actually get one. Yeah. Oh, so th there is such a thing as zero. It does exist. They don't call it zero. They call it well, uh, but unlimited light. Okay. Un let's see if it's unlimited light. Then it is something you can talk about. It has light. There's Therefore, there's it's three, two. There's, there's three zeros which yeah. come. You yeah. can say so before you even reach the one. So, okay. You see, if it is light and it is, then it's something that is and has light, or these two, well, therefore it's dual. It, it's like a doubt. It's, as soon as you start describing it, you're yeah, okay. going wrong. Okay. So it, it is something yeah. which is just before, even more essential, if yeah. you could say, yeah. than the one. Yeah. See, the idea of the one in Plato has no predicates. In you, Plato doesn't, but I'm saying can't in, other, even, in, in other systems. Yeah, but you can't even call it one. Then it becomes the same as thou, if you right. can't call it one. You can't call it one. The first hypothesis, stay there. Mm -hmm. Right, see so that stays there. Right. So, his idea of the one... Is the same as that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. As a matter of fact, he has five different ideas of the one. And that's one of them. <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> historical question was, uh, pardon me, pardon me, I was chuckling. Uh, historical question was, was Benjamin Franklin a uh, philosopher king? Benjamin? Franklin. I don't, I don't think so because there's no room for a guy that goes around and flies kites in a storm. Yeah, but he was, well, he but, he was but wasn't he healthy, wealthy, and wise? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Wasn't he healthy, wealthy, and wise and he was... I, I think he's got a lot of very fine qualities. I've never thought of that question. It would, it's a nice one. And uh, if I knew more about Benjamin, I guess I could answer you, but I don't. It seems like we were, we were all philosopher kings. They were just, we were some of us we were, were better at being a philosopher king than others were. And for him, you see, for him, it takes a particular quality which comes from when you're firmly entrenched here, when, you're, when you can remain there, when you can firmly 
grasp that realm, so, as he calls it, settled. When one is settled, then, then there's the birth of intellect and truth. Which then, once that's born, you see why that's so important in Plato, especially in the Republic, that with, see, the whole training is to bring about that experience. Why? So then you can use that to, to then do the higher study and pursue the nature of the one. That's why it's used. See, that's the intermediary stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, about the philosopher King, within Islam we have a story, and other uh, traditions have the same story mm -hmm. described to other people. Ali, the prophet's son-in-law, um, the first imam, mm -hmm. was fighting a war and he was about to kill an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And the guy spits in his face and immediately mm -hmm. stops mm -hmm. and does not kill him. And the guy says, why did you stop? I mean, you were about to kill me yeah. for God and now I've in your face. I expect yeah, yeah, to be yeah. killed. He said, I was angry beforehand. I was doing it for the sake of God. Now, if I killed you, I would be doing it for my ego. I cannot do that. And immediately the guy sees the truth and converts to Islam, right. of okay. course. But so, uh, it's the idea that to be a philosopher king, you have to be a warrior, but you can't take it personally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what's real f interesting about this whole republic, you say, is that this is very clearly what is called an analogy. And the question is, is it meant to be put into existence? Has it ever been put into existence? Can it be put into existence, this republic or politeia? Right? Shall we spend our time and effort in trying, in, in, in trying to bring about these people then to rule the state? Can it be a blueprint for politics? That's the whole question. Well, I have a great quote for you. Right. And uh, Plato at the end of book nine has just a, what I call a delicious quote. And uh, he deals with that and he's got a very interesting um, At the end of book nine. I understand, he said, you mean in our city, the city which we have described and founded in words, for I don't think it exists anywhere on earth. Socrates comes back. Well, in heaven, perhaps, a pattern of it is indeed laid up for him that has eyes to see and seeing to settle himself therein. It matters nothing whether it exists anywhere or shall exist, for he would practice the principles of this city only, no other. So it's not even, it's, it's not a, hi. Hi. I noticed that you used one of Tropos's propositions to talk about the nature of the good and the one. And I'm yeah. wondering why you did that. I mean, I, would, I was surprised. I've never seen you go out of the Republic to talk about a principle from the Republic, like the good and the one being identical. It, would, yes, it would save me a great deal of time, which is why I did it. I have to bring in the theory of art and a lot of other things. Okay. So this that is was a, really interesting. This I've was, never seen you do that This before. was, yeah, yeah. Because you... You did have to pull in a proposition from another guy who came after Plato. Yeah, but I think he can also, I think it's possible it? to find it in Plato too, by the way. Okay, yeah. does it show it better than, than the Republic? I mean, was that- Well, did it way? save me time? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yes. Um, two questions, one so I can get to the second question. Uh, first question is to avoid what happened last time. Um, are you familiar with that guy, uh, Gurdjieff? Yeah. Okay. 
then the question is, when you were reading 443DE, it sounded like he was talking about all these multiple ones within the psyche. Mm -hmm. and that's the guy who really pulled it all together and sort of bound up the three qualities and then and mm -hmm. pulled all together all his ones into, into one one. Mm -hmm. And that group, your chief, he sort of talks about all the ones sort of, you know, every once in a while taking hold, hold of you in a random manner. He says to just look at yourself all the time. If I understood what he's talking about, he's saying just watch yourself all the time. And then after a while, if you keep watching and you do it steadily, all that stuff dissolves and then you have one no. oneself. No. Is, is, no. Is, is he pulling that out of Plato or are they just two mm, same I, ideas? Or? I, uh, See, when someone has it that succinctly, I think you might be able to infer it from Plato. But that looks much more like influence from um, um, a wide variety of, of sources, especially uh, um, uh, Sri Rama, oh no, um, Rama Maharshi would be very, would be very, very close, and in that same age, and also in, in uh, certainly in, in uh, Neoplatonism, the latter part of Neoplatonism, rather than Plato. So because, let me give an example, and, and in Buddhism, of course, um, what is it that sees and hears at this very moment? Right, like right now, what is it that's seeing and hearing? So keep yourself right in the moment. Right now, what is seeing? Forget everything else. What's seeing right now? And the fun thing would be, if you were able to grasp that, would you use terms like the one? Uh, Basui, uh, 15th century Buddhist, right? Um, his last words before he died was, uh, hey, look, Look directly. What is this? Same thing. Look. Yeah, look directly. Look directly. What is this? So that theme runs through very succinctly and clearly, and I think it can be found in other traditions than, than uh, Plato. I'm not sure whether. It would seem that in a uh, person who has come out of uh, uh, Western uh, Western culture, because would seem unlikely that a person could have, uh, have avoided the thinking of Plato. Even though they may not have read Plato directly, but it would seem that uh, that uh, that the the progression progression of of uh, philosophical thought in Western in Western culture would uh, would have uh, come through. You know, come not, not that these ideas are necessarily original with Plato, but they but they would have come through Plato. Mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. either to be considered and refined upon or discarded. True. Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes they make a distinction between book religions and non book religions. Revealed religions, Zoroaster, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, um, they have book religions, and if, and if their books were to disappear entirely, there would be no basis to restore them. But in non-book religions, you find a commonness that, that is present throughout history. And you could destroy all of those works, and someone could re rediscover the same thought in different forms, and you could easily reconstruct it. Those are the two different ways of looking at book religions and non-book religions. So yes, I think you're right. Uh, uh, I think one of the most important questions you're raising is whether or not we can see behind Plato that there must have been a vast and profound tradition because he comes so full and complete when he enters into the into literature which was just beginning in those days. I want to ask yeah. about Plato and Pythagoras. Is there any relation between Socrates and Pythagoras? In fact, well, all this theory of number, etc. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Extremely yeah. 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 Uh, Yes, and he does use, and he does very often use uh, people's names in his dialogues that were Pythagoreans, like the two major thinkers in uh, uh, the Phaedo. Um, 
and in other places. Uh, was, and certainly the time is, was the time is, has a lot of yeah, numerology. But what was the background of uh, Socrates' teacher? We don't know anything. No. Do, has anybody else written about her? Because other people wrote about Socrates. But has anybody yes. else wrote about Socrates' teacher? Other than Plato? There's a big, there's there are many people want to say that when, he ref when Socrates references his teacher, it's a myth. He just made it up. Other people say, no, it must have existed. And the reason, perhaps, why there's such a difficulty in it is not only because he always has a lot of fun, and uh, you never know sometimes when he's being literally true or not, is the fact that he mentions that his teacher was a woman. Exactly, yes. And, you know, you have to be careful about that. I mean, you don't want to give too much credit to women. <laughs> so his teacher was <laughs> his teacher was Diotima of Mantronia, who was a very very magnificent appearing woman, and so many scholars want to say, oh no, that could never be, that never could never be, but I I don't know. Having gone through uh, into uh, academic philosophy and uh, made it out without losing my mind, uh, this idea of the Republic being something of a full theory of the state or something like that is really pervasive. In and uh, it seems to me kind of ironic. It seems that if you push the Republic into some sort of uh, manifestation, uh, just by doing that itself, you're pushing yourself below the divided line. That's right. You're trying to create a set of beliefs and images and yeah. somehow or another handle Plato as uh, that, which is some kind of uh, you know, concrete idea. And then you'll search around history and look for certain people who may or may not be that. And yeah. uh, if you do find people in history, I would find that they're probably not very famous to start with, oh. and uh, that they are quite introspective and contem oh. contemplative people, so that they can use the analogy here, because uh, mm. once you say, okay, this is Plato's theory of mm -hmm. uh, the state, mm -hmm. then you're already stuck in the sure. world of images and beliefs. Sure. You're not going to go anywhere. Into I think your point is well taken, that if you were to try to bring this into reality, Socrates would have come by and said, hey, excuse me, before you do that, why don't you bring yourself into a oneness? And if you do, maybe you won't be foolish enough to try to build something. But, but uh, I think the people who have a lot of fun with this concept are the Taoists. And the Taoists, you know, there's stories of people discovering a wise man and trying to bring him into the public arena and make him a public magistrate. And they hide and they run away and they don't want to be caught. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of fun. And I can only leave you with the question of, uh, what's the one? I know. <laughs> Good. One more than zero. Thank you very much. It seems okay. like